Good evening, church. Glad to see you here tonight and glad you could be here as we kick off a new series that we're going to be doing in our discussion groups. Well, I wonder, is the theme that we're going to talk about, and obviously that may draw to mind several things. There's a couple songs that come to mind as I even say the phrase. And, um, but I love the idea of thinking, and I love the idea of asking questions, and I love the idea of being able to come together to work out answers, solutions to those questions. You ever had something that just burned on you? And you wanted to ask a question, but, oh man, I don't know, is, is this the right time? Or what if people think I'm dumb? Or is this a silly question? And you've held back on some level. You ever been through that? And at some point, your teacher's like, listen, there are no dumb questions. And you're like, but there are. There are, because I've said them, and Timmy over there said three the last week, so there are. So sometimes we hold ourselves back. But when we're talking about the Bible, and when we're talking about our faith, and we're talking about our relationship with God, and if we really truly believe that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, if we really believe that's critical to our growth, then I've got to know that book as best I possibly can. I've got to. And I know that in studying that book, the Bible, that there's going to be times I'm going to have questions and I need answers. Now, we've all probably been through that thing where we read through it and we're like, I don't know what that means, but I'll just read on, kind of gloss through it a little bit and just hope I get to some place where it feels a little more safe. I get that. I get that. But sometimes we need to go back as we get to the point we can handle it and say, I need to ask a question. I need to get an answer. I need to sort this thing out just a little bit. Because we're allowed to ask questions. In Christianity, you are allowed to ask questions. I've said it before and I'll say it again. If you ever go to a place and they tell you, you stop asking questions right now. That's a red flag. Be careful. You need to know the Bible, and you need to be able to ask things you don't understand, and ask why, and how, and what, and who. Those are fair things that we should be allowed to do. And that's quite different than having someone say, this is what you will believe. Ooh, that's a red flag. Be careful about that. But when we ask questions, we have to go to the source to get the right answer. Be diligent, the Bible says. Be diligent. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman needeth not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. That's what we want to do. Rightly divide the word of truth. So how do we do that? Well, we got to ask questions. And we got to sort. And we got to learn and have a foundation. And we're allowed to do that. But we learn over time, we think sometimes, mistakenly, there'll be a point where I'm going to get it all. That'll never happen. You will constantly be in a state of learning, and that's exciting. To me, that's exciting. You will constantly be at a point where you're asking, can I do that better? Or can I clarify that a little bit more? Or did I ever really know that? It's a great humbling position of being a Christian. You know you don't know it all. You know you're never going to know it all. But you can constantly learn more, and that is exciting. It keeps life fresh. It keeps it, it, keeps it pretty exciting. You, you never stop and say, that's it. I've got nothing else to explore or live for. I get to know more. Well, that's why we want to spend time. What do you wonder? What do you think about? Now, we can guess sometimes, and there's some basic things that most people do. But sometimes we sit here and, and we say to ourselves, listen, I appreciate how the church is working on answering questions. But sometimes they're not the questions I'm asking. And I'd really love to have that. That's why I want to spend the next few weeks, months, answering those kind of questions. So I, we need to communicate in the midst of that. And I asked for it this morning. Can you give me your questions that you would like to discuss? And I got some. And I got some good ones. And some of you said, you know what? Let me write it down and I'll get it to you. I said, thank you so much. So I'm starting the list. I'm starting the list. I would tell you at the moment they're trending a little eschatological towards end time things and they're trending towards some of the more supernatural things and that's great. Thank you, those of you that have given questions so far. But also, thank you to the ones that are about to write some or text me or send them to them. They're valuable. And you may sit there and go like, I don't know, is he talking about my questions? Yes. 
yes, I am. And you're like, but just stop right there. Don't, don't, do a, don't do a stop yourself sort of thing where you won't write the question on, yes, yours. If you're seven years old and you're like, I got a question, write it down. I would love to hear it. If you're 77 years old, please. If you're 107, I got questions for you. How? <laughs> what are you eating? We've got to be able to have those exchanges back and forth. And everyone's question has value. We need to be a congregation that values those kinds of questions and especially values teaching people how to get to those answers in the scriptures. That's equipping you to handle the word. That's equipping you to be able to discuss the word with the people around us, which is so critical. Earlier this week, I was listening to a podcast, and it was great. And they were talking about this church out west and what they had done to equip the members, and it's, it's large, but they had set it up so that there were times in which people that they had attracted interest from online presence, whether through social media or their website or whatever, would contact the church and they would ask a series of questions to the church. But it wasn't the ministers and the elders and the deacons and whatever that were answering those questions. It was the members. And they were like, what? How is that possible? And that struck me. The fact that you would be shocked, and maybe we are shocked, so we can be honest about this, that you would be shocked that the members can't handle some of those questions. To me, that looks like an opportunity, doesn't it? How do we get our members to be able to do that? And you may sit there and go like, I don't know if I can answer those questions. I bet you do better than you think. You might do better than you think. And what you can't actually do, you can learn to do. And that congregation had spent time training people, prepping them for that. And the goal was to, of course, to get them if it was pretty heavy, how do we connect them to people that can have Bible studies with them so that they can become Christians? How do we connect them with people if they just really need counseling? And how do we connect them to people? So really, they were going through a series of phases where it was equipping the entire congregation to be part of the process. It wasn't one or two people. It was as many as wanted to be. Well, you get there because you ask questions. Can you teach me more? Yes. Yes. Can you help me sort through this so I don't do it alone? Absolutely. That's what church is about. Okay. Can we make a difference in our community? Yes, you absolutely can. The better you're equipped in the word, of, of course, you can make a better, better um, showing to the community. All right. So let's break this down. When I say that I would love questions or several types of questions that we can get. And I think it's important to see that these exist in the Bible as well. And so there's a, a, a biblical uh, example that we have. And we're going to start off with the ones where we probably will not spend as much time on these. Uh, there's not really need to. We might at the beginning just to get to know one another, but it's not the real emphasis. And that's opinions. Opinions. These can be fun sometimes. They really can be as long as they're appropriate or whatever. What? is your favorite book of the Bible. I would be interested to know that for some people. For me, it changes week to week. This week, I think it's probably Romans. Next week, it'll be something else, I'm sure. You may have a favorite of all time. Which is your least favorite gospel? Oh no, I'm not comfortable answering that. <laughs> Maybe. But there's opinion things in there, and we need to categorize them in opinions and understand they don't have the same force as many of these other questions. But they're also interesting and there's value in them so that we can get to know one another. Because if we hear those things, the follow-up of, well, why? Why is that your opinion? Well, that's pretty interesting. And, you know, sort of leaning on to what we talked about this morning of getting to know one another and do that. I think there's value in that to a degree. But when we get into the things that are really about forming your faith and shaping who you are and landing you in a place where you can really grow, there's other kind of questions we want to deal with. One, number two, we'll start with one that's slightly, just a little, a little to the side, and you're just like, oh, that's interesting. That's rhetorical questions. Go to Romans chapter 8 with me, if you will, and this will be an example of where in the Bible sometimes rhetoric is used, or rhetorical question is used, rather, um, to make a point, a proclamation, a statement, a fact about something. But even within these kinds of questions, it kind of acts as a springboard for things for us to consider. In Romans 8, beginning in verse 31, we have a really good example of that. Paul is, this is a fantastic verse, a uh, fantastic chapter in and of itself, Romans chapter 8. 
a lot of wonderful things come out of it. But then he's, he's closing the chapter out, and he begins it with these series of rhetorical questions. He's not necessarily waiting for a response, but it's making a strong proclamation of a fact. And he starts with this. Well, what shall we say to these, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? What a statement. If God is for us, who can be against us? He's not wanting you to say, well, perhaps it would be, and make a list. It's such a strong proclamation. The point is, nobody. Oh, they may oppose you, but will they be victorious? No. Why? Our God is all-powerful. Will they be able to stop the works of God? No. Why? Our God said quite strongly that the gates of Hades shall not prevail against his church, his kingdom. It cannot be stopped. Will there be moments in which it's very, very difficult? Yes, historically, we know that. We know that. And even at the very beginning of the church, when it was so small and under such oppression and persecution, even like what we talked about in Acts chapter 8, or even from a historical uh, standpoint, when you look into the very earliest parts of the 4th century, when it was made illegal to own a Bible, churches were supposed to give them over to the Roman uh, government. They would burn them and get rid of them. Did the church fall? No. No, there were faithful people. Did God look out for his people? Yes. Could even the might of the, the, the greatest uh, empire at that time stop the church? No. On paper, that's an absurd thing to say. The church has no military force. It wasn't really especially prominent in the sense of a political form. It didn't have incredible power from a worldly standpoint, but they had God, and God will not fall. If God is for us, who, who can be against us? What a powerful question. It's a proclamation, but there's so many things that can come out of that in a discussion, and those are fun things to talk about. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things who shall bring any charge against God's elect it is God who justifies who is to condemn Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that who was raised who is at the right hand of God who indeed is interceding for us who shall separate us from the love of Christ shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword He's closing this chapter out with a series of questions, rhetorical questions, where he is building up that church in Rome. How can you not read that passage and that series of questions go, yes, 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 we know who we are in the church and it is, it is valuable and it's victorious and it's triumphant. Ooh, that's a powerful set of questions in just one tiny little section. It's the power of those kinds of questions. These are proclamations. There's a series of them throughout the Bible. Sometimes it's worth asking about these statements. Because when we look at them, it begs us. It begs us to ask all kinds of other questions. That's the real power in the context we're talking about in the next few weeks. If God is for us, who can stand against us? What about the devil? We might start asking questions about the devil. Is he equal to God? Are they two sides of the same coin? Or are there limitations to the devil? Those are fair questions. And I know that there's people listening, perhaps tonight, online, or even here, that has wondered those things. I promise you those things have been taught by various religious groups and people proclaiming themselves as philosophers. You've got God, you've got the devil, it's a balance of the thing, and your life will depend on which one you go to in equal measures. Is that what the Bible says? No, it's not, but it's worth asking those questions so you can be sure. You can be sure and be confident. And then the next question is, well, how does that impact my life? If I know that God has no equal, and if I know that not even the devil, the great adversary, if not even he can equal God in his might and his amb ambition and in his greed, and it's not the, the equal and opposite, then truly no one, no one can stop the plans and the wills of God. 
What a valuable thing to know. And it comes about because of a question that begs more questions. So I love these rhetorical questions. They're very valuable. I suspect the ones that we'll spend some time with are the, the next three overall. One is the seeking kind of questions. Sometimes we ask questions because we're seeking to know God a little bit more, a little bit better, or we're seeking to understand the kind of life God wants us to have. These are incredibly important. And there's some that you'll go like, yeah, I get that, and move on. And some will be more personal to you than others, but ask those questions. David did so in Psalm chapter 119 and verse 9. And I'm going to have the ESV translation of it up here because it gets really to it very, very clear when he says, how can a young man keep his way pure? How can a young man keep his way pure? What a valuable question to ask. Certainly when David wrote it over 3,000 years ago, but also certainly today, isn't it? How does anyone keep their way pure? Especially in this world, which makes impure so easy to see and so easy to mix with and so easy to interact with and impure is so accessible so accessible and because of that we have people struggling honestly struggling with how how do i stay pure when it seems like from all directions and everywhere around me even from you know places that should be good and safe and whatever, there's still this element of that there. And certainly when I just want to go online and play a game, these things pop up on my screen and I, I didn't want to see that. Or I didn't know what I was about to read and the influences of people around me that I thought I could trust these people, but they're leading me in a direction I don't want to go. How? How can I keep my way pure? What a relevant question. Very relevant question. It's seeking to know God's will in your life. These are valuable questions. Right now, you may be thinking, okay, I got two or three in that category. I hope you write them down. And I hope you send them to me. And I hope we can talk about them. Not just from the pulpit, we'll get started, but if you haven't attended before, you haven't seen their discussion groups, what we'll do is we'll have an introduction of it, and then we will separate into groups that you choose, which one you want to go to, and then we'll discuss it together. Because you're going to have wisdom and you're going to have insights that I won't have, and we'll, we'll trade with that. Alan and Rodney and Andrew will also teach various other classes, and of course, we have the ones for the younger, younger kids upstairs as well. But we're going to spend time discussing these together, these questions. You've got a lot of experience, but I hope what you see is we're much more equipped than we might think we are. How can a young man keep his way pure? Complicated, nuanced. David gets us really, really started in the rest of that, starting in verse, well, the second part of verse 9, and he goes on through the section. And he has such an intense focus on God in the midst of it. I know I can move on to the next one, but I feel like we can't leave this alone. He says, by guarding it according to your word. If you want to keep your way pure, your path pure, you guard it by keeping it according to the word of God. You guard it and you protect it. With my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. He stored up the word in his heart. That means there's a value to it but he's taking it within him. That means if you want to keep your way pure, you take the scriptures inside of you, not in a weird way where you're eating it or something, but you can memorize it. You can memorize it. It's not too laborious, all right? You can do it. And I know sometimes it's a little harder and for some people. I memorize numbers pretty good. Words sometimes, song lyrics, can't do it. I don't know why. I am awful. But scripture, oh, it's worth putting the effort in. There's a time when your way will be challenged, your path will be challenged. And there'll be a, a challenge to it that's going to be, you want to stay pure, but it's going to try to something, some temptation, somebody, some place, something is going to try to lead you away from it. But if you've got the word, God's commandments in you, and it's committed to your heart and you value them, and you can draw them up in your mind, oh, that's a powerful tool to stay on track and see exactly where you need to go. How can I keep my way pure? What a powerful question. You guard it, you protect it, you store it up in your heart that you may not sin against God. 
Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. Having that desire to learn even more the word of God, even greater the details and the nuances. You know, sometimes we hear these Bible stories and we're like, yeah, I've heard it. Which means you know about the general concept. Sure, we could do that. And, and, and many times we do, but do you know it? I mean, you know the details, you know the concepts, you know the thing behind it. You know the context in a bigger picture. You know how it connects from the Old Testament to the New Testament. You, you understand how it can direct your path. You understand perhaps three ways God would want you to know that. Do you know it? That's much more than just saying, I acknowledge that there's a story about Noah, and there's a boat, and there's a flood. True. But do you know really what's going on in terms of obedience and righteousness and the grace of God? Do you know about God's provision? So specific, but so, so doable. And God's desire for man to be successful. Do you know God's efforts for mankind to be saved? Even though everyone else was evil, God cared about the individual. And you could go on and on. Know, know the scriptures, not just loosely about them. That will equip you. He's saying, put that in you. That'll keep your way pure. It's a valuable kind of question to ask. He says, with my lips, I declare all the rules of your your mouth. You know it so well, it's in you so deep, you can say it. That's a good test. If you can say it out loud and form your thoughts in a way, you know it pretty well. That's a good place to stand. And whatever you learn new, can you articulate that back when questioned? I know sometimes it makes us pretty nervous to, uh, to do that sort of thing, but if you can do that, you generally not just understand it, not just acknowledge that you're aware of it, but you know it well enough that you can speak it out loud. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. He's even going to sit and think about it and pray on it and think about it and contemplate it. He's spending time in the word. How can a young man keep his way? Oh, the Bible gives an answer. The Bible gives an answer. Then we go and say, okay, in the 21st century, 2024 in Evansville, how do I make that happen? That's what we discuss. And it's very valuable. Very valuable. Please ask the questions. Don't hold back. This is a seeking kind of question. Seeking to know God's will and God's path. It unfolds in other ways as well. Acts chapter 16, verse 30. This is the Philippian jailer. Paul and Silas had been locked in jail, not because they'd done anything truly, truly wrong. They had cast a spirit out of a girl, and that had cost some men to lose their income. And so they're cast into jail, and about midnight they're singing and worshiping God in many ways. And God frees them in a miraculous ways, and the, all the jail cell, the prison cell doors open up, and the, the guard there, he's about to kill himself, and they stop him. But he asks this question, what shall I do to be saved? What shall I do to be saved? What a question. What a question. When you get to that question, whether he meant it, how do I not die by Roman law for allowing the prisoners to go? Or how do I save my soul because I'm in the midst of sin? Either way, it's a question where you are seeking answers that have an incredible impact. This isn't trivia. This isn't just mere academia. This is a question that's leading you closer to God that's about saving your soul to transform your life. It's a seeking question. It's very, very powerful. I'm so glad he asked that question. I wonder about all the people that wonder those kind of things, but they never ask the question. They never wonder hard enough to ask and seek the answer. This is an example of where this guy, he asked. He put himself out there and he got an answer and he was baptized and he became a Christian. A transformative life occurred because he's willing to ask. He was seeking after what is God's will. Huge amount of questions that could come out of that. And I hope that gets you started thinking about some that you might also ask. I got some examples that I've been asked in the past. None, none today. So I'm not treading on anyone's questions here. Sometimes people ask me about the way that we do some things. 
The Bible tells us over and over that we repent, repent, repent. And sometimes we'll offer the invitation, which I will shortly offer the invitation. And I will inevitably make some mention about if you need to repent, come forward. Do I need to come forward to repent? Do I need to do that? That's a fair question. What if I don't? Can I still be forgiven? That's a fair question. Why do we do it this way? That's a fair question. Are there some sins that I can handle at home by myself? Or some, do I need to say it in front of everybody? And how will they respond? Those are real questions. I hope those kinds of questions get asked. We need to talk about them. There's another one. I've been asked this in the past. It's seeking. It's honestly seeking. It's not rebellious. It's really wanting an answer. If I'm dealing with anxiety, fair enough these days, am I sinning according to Matthew chapter 6, 25, which says, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what will you put on? Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? I've been asked that question before, and it's from an honest position. A person didn't want to sin, but they're dealing with anxiety. I mean, it's really hitting them. But the Bible there says, don't be anxious. Now, there's an answer to that, and there's a word answer to that, and we don't have time to go into it tonight. But what I want you to see is there are real questions you may be thinking, and these came from real people. Please give me an answer, because they need, they need to know in order to please God the most. Maybe we're talking some questions and answers and discussing things in the church, but is it the questions that you want to hear, that you need to hear? There's value in that. We need to give time to that. So please, again, an encouragement, ask the questions that are about seeking. The other one's about doubts. There are questions that come up about doubts. We have biblical examples of this too. Some are quite interesting. You remember John the Baptist was the one that came as the voice crying in the wilderness to proclaim Jesus, the Messiah, he's here. Matthew chapter 3, fantastic, you can read about that. You know in Luke, the, who his mother is, who his father is, that the angel Gabriel proclaimed that he was coming and that he, he's Jesus' cousin and he, he had this particular job. And there was these moments in which we see Jesus coming and he points to him, he says, behold, the Lamb of God. You got these other moments in which John the baptizer, John the Baptist is saying, I'm not even worthy to, to unloose his sandals proclaiming Jesus in the midst of that. And, and even when Jesus wanted to be baptized, he says, I need to be baptized by you. I must diminish that he, yeah, he pointed to Jesus over and over and over. But there was this moment in Luke chapter 7, verse 20. And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you saying, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? Jesus gave an answer, and that's a thing we need to remember. Sometimes, even as Christians, even as people that you say, well, yeah, I know everyone, they expect me to know. They don't expect me to have a doubt. They don't expect me to go through difficulties in my faith. If a guy like John the Baptist can ask that kind of question, well, I think we can as well. And if John the Baptist had the confidence to go to the right source, looking for the true answer, then we can too. What a great example for us. If we're asking the question so as to push away, that's different. If we're asking the question so that we can turn to people that are going to be rebellious or we turn to people who don't also have an answer and, and aren't interested in finding one, not so wise. But if we have these doubts and we're able to confront them in the Word with someone who's been through it and navigated that, well, now we're being wise. That's being wise. I want to know the truth. And sometimes even when there's questions that come because of doubts, I have to have enough faith in the Bible that it can handle those doubts. And I have to have enough faith in Jesus that he wants us to navigate through those. And sometimes it's a long process to get through that. But we're allowed to go through that process. We want to move from doubt to faith, to certainty, to trust, to belief, to action, to transformation. Questions can help us do that. And we can't be scared of them uh, in those moments. I love being able to do that. Finally, healthy curiosity. 
Sometimes there's just a healthy curiosity where we are just like, let me build what I already know. And there's passages in scriptures where you may read them. And I said before, you glaze right over it. Here's like, I don't know what that means. Big, crazy words, and I'll move on. You ever think about that in Hebrews chapter 6? I know they're studying Hebrews in the adult class in here. But there's this passage in here, and this has come up before with some people. And it's talking about Jesus and Jesus being a high priest. And it's making these comparisons from Old Testament to New Testament. But there's these phrases in here that if you just kind of go through it, well, verse 20 of Hebrews 6, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. What? Is that some ancient secret Hebrew word? What does that mean? Well, that's a great question. You should be able to ask that question. And we would spend time going back to Genesis chapter 14. We talk about Melchizedek and who he was. And we could also go to Psalm uh, 110, verse 4, I think. Another mention of Melchizedek. But also here in the book of Hebrews. But there's answers that you can get. And it's just building on your curiosity. We're allowed to do that. It's a healthy curiosity. Because we should stand in awe and respect of the scriptures. And we should go on, hmm, I can't let that pass. I need to know what that means. If I'm willing to, if you've talked to me at all about movies and you bring up a thing that I do not know, I'll be like, what? I've never heard of that. And I'll get my phone out and have to look it up. If I've got that kind of desire for movies, which are fun and entertaining or whatever, shouldn't I be even more intense about the Bible? Shouldn't I? And if you've got that kind of intensity when it comes to sports or uh, music or whatever your hobbies may be, shouldn't it be more intense about the Bible? I would hope so. The Bible will have a deeper impact on your life, certainly on your soul, certainly on your eternal life. Give it its due diligence. Give it its due time. It's due respect. It's due love. Treasure it. Have a healthy curiosity to know as much as you possibly can. Why is the Bible organized the way it is? Great question. Has it always looked that way? Great question. Acts chapter 15, verses 19 and 20, they're they're dealing with the Gentiles and there's, uh, uh, should they be accepted as Christians? And they say, yes, they are. And then they give them a whole series of things. We should write to them, they say in verse 20, uh, that they should abstain from these things, polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled, and from blood. And you may say, what? What is that? Don't pass it over. Sit with it. Meditate on it. Go back. To the source in the Old Testament that explains those things, you can track that over time. But it's best if we do it together. Healthy curiosity. There's a numerous amount of questions that you might ask. I give you these five kinds of examples because I want to kind of, here you go, here's a starting place. And you may be thinking to yourself, well, David, I've got question six type and number seven type. Great. I love it. We're, we're losing time right now. But you can still ask those kinds of questions. If it's about knowing the Bible better, if it's about drawing closer to God, if it's about seeking His will, if it's about really building up what we already know, and if it's about getting there in a, in a, in a beneficial way, in a helpful way, let's ask those questions and let's search through them. If it's rebellious, stop. If it's to turn people away from the Bible, don't need that. I don't suspect that's what we'll get. But if it's honest and it's true, and there's a real desire to love God in the midst of it, please, please ask those questions. I'm excited to be able to have these discussions. I'm excited to hear what you, what you, you want to know, and I'm excited to what we learn together uh, in these discussion groups. I think there's a big opportunity here, and I hope our congregation can grow from that. We'll close out tonight with the invitation. I told you it was going to happen. And you may have been saying, wait, did he mean I have to come for Maybe. Maybe you should come forward. Why would you do that? Sometimes sin is hitting us so hard, and maybe not even just sin. Maybe sometimes life is hitting you so hard that you say, I really, truly need help. Really, I can't do it on my own. And and I need the church, the whole church. What I need you to understand is that if a person does come forward, and I know it used to be this many years ago, predominantly it was a walk of shame where people would walk down the center of the aisle or they'd come up and everybody would go like, oh, no, what did they do? Or at least people internalized it that way. 
That's not helpful. I'm not even sure it's godly. What if when a person walks forward, it was that person needs help? And immediately the church starts praying for them. Lord, I don't know what they're going through. I don't know if it's sin. I don't know if it's distress. I don't know if just, it's just beating them up. But Lord, be with them now. You could start your prayer the moment they come up. That's an act of love. Why come forward? Because there's an act of love that can take place. Not judgment, love. And even if it's a person that comes forward and says, I've sinned. And I mean, I've sinned bad. I mean, it's really bad. And it's very, very public. And so in a public way, I need your help. I need repentance. I need to navigate through this. Then publicly, it's okay for the church to say, we're here for you. We are here for you. We'll cry with you. We'll mourn with you. We'll go through it together. Together. Sometimes there's sins where it's just you and God and you can handle that. Sometimes there's some life issues. It's just you and God and it just can stay between the two of you. But sometimes... You need more. You need more. And if that's the case, just know that this is a place that loves you. This is a place that will support you. And this is a place that you can come to, even if it's publicly. And if that's something you want to talk about later, we'll do that too. Whatever your need is, in the most genuine way possible, in the most real way possible, expressing truly the love of God, that's exactly what we want to do. We have to. Your soul is that important. It's that important. And even tonight, if you want to become a Christian, or you want to learn how to become a Christian, please let us know that. There's no greater decision you could possibly ever make. Tonight, if your question is, what must I do to be saved? Please, let's talk about that. I don't know what your need is, and maybe tonight you don't have one, and maybe it comes Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You can still ask, hey, can we talk? Yeah, we absolutely can. We will. But tonight... If there is a need, come forward as we stand and as we sing.